All right, hello everyone, and welcome back to our next lecture video. This is the respiratory system. We're going to discuss respiration. So our respiratory uh, system, respiratory physiology, we're talking about the exchange of gas at the level of the lungs and the level of the tissue. Internal respiration is going to be respiration at the level of the tissue, exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide, External respiration is respiration at the level of the lungs, exchanging oxygen for carbon dioxide. So our function of the respiratory system is that exactly, it's gas exchange. So we're moving oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as other minor gases that we find in the atmosphere like hydrogen, nitrogen, and other things of that nature. We're going to be able to maintain acid-base balance partly because of this, because this carbon dioxide that we uh, breathe off is going to promote acidity and promoting acidity will lower the pH of our bodies and we want to keep that pH in a normal set range. So breathing off carbon dioxide, breathing in oxygen helps to maintain that. The lungs are the functional units of the respiratory system. They contain little air sacs known as alveoli which expand and retract when they are filled with atmospheric air they are going to be the level at which the gases are exchanged with the bloodstream. Two sections of the respiratory system, the conducting zone and the functional exchange zone. The conducting zone is all of the airways that channel, uh, channel air in and out of the body, but don't actually exchange anything with the body's bloodstream. The functional exchange zone is going to be at the level of the alveoli, where we do have the air exchanging. When we breathe, we have pressures that dictate our lung inflation and deflation. And the pressures that we see are going to be changing based off of inspiration and expiration. During inspiration, we have a negative internal pressure relative to atmospheric pressure. And that is going to cause the lungs to inflate, causes the lungs to expand with our negative pressure. During expiration, when we have the diaphragm relaxed, that's the musculature that is going to allow the thoracic cage to open. The diaphragm is going to relax and come back up. During expiration, there is going to be a positive pressure inside of the body compared to the atmospheric pressure outside. And that causes the lungs to deflate or get smaller. Blood flow to the actual lung itself is going to come directly from the heart. In this case, we have the one section where an artery is going to be carrying deoxygenated blood in the body. So here the pulmonary artery is going to carry blood from the heart into the lungs. Pulmonary artery is filled with mixed venous blood. Flow from the pulmonary uh, artery into the lungs, then we have it diverted into the pulmonary veins. And here we have the situation where the veins are carrying oxygenated blood. This is the only time in the body where we have a vein that is carrying oxygenated blood and that pulmonary vein carries the blood from the lung back to the heart. The pulmonary vein, after it has been oxygenated, now carries the blood from the lung back to the left atrium. When we have a lack of oxygen, all right, a lack of oxygen completely in the body is known as anoxia, A meaning absence of Noxia oxygen, so a complete lack of oxygen. If we have a complete lack of oxygen in the body, there is no oxygen left at all for any sort of exchange. This will cause cell death in roughly about four minutes. Anoxia is the complete lack of oxygen. We're never really going to have that unless there is a case of complete asphyxiation. Um, by the time we'd reach anoxia, we would be dead. So. In cases of low oxygen, this is going to be either hypoxia or hypoxemia. And in the case of hypoxia, this is where we have lower than normal oxygen levels and lower than normal oxygen to be able to be exchanged. Low oxygen levels are then going to lead to less aerobic metabolism, which in turn leads to more lactic acid production. We also have carbon dioxide retention that is going to be caused by low oxygen carbon dioxide exchange. So we have two acidic compounds there that would build up in the case of hypoxia. Carbon dioxide 
and also lactic acid. Hypoxemia is going to be low uh, oxygen, specifically in the arteries. So that means that we're going to have low oxygen in the arterial plasma, but not in the venous side. All right. So the oxygen levels in the venous side typically going to be around 40 millimeters of mercury. All right, so we're going to have about 40 there. And that's going to be the case if we have normal breathing or if we have hypoxemia. So hypoxemia means there's less arterial oxygen, which means that there's less oxygen that can be exchanged with the tissues. Our respiratory control is going to come from the neurological centers. Our respiratory control is going to dictate how much we breathe, how fast we breathe, and how deeply we breathe. So the control mechanisms for the respiratory center are all going to be on the arterial side of the circulation. Arterial side of the circulation has baroreceptors okay, and chemoreceptors. The chemoreceptors are going to uh, register things like carbon dioxide concentration and hydrogen ion concentration, which is protons. The respiratory control is largely based off of acid-base balance. So if there's a pH change in the blood, let's say there's a carbon dioxide buildup or a lactic acid buildup, and we have acidity going on, the pH will get lower. And as the pH gets lower, the respiratory chemo, uh, chemoreceptors will sense that and cause respiration to increase, trying to breathe off that carbon dioxide. So we see the case of acid-base balance tightly intertwined with respiratory control. When we have a situation like metabolic acidosis, this is where we have enhanced tissue metabolism faster than we can use oxygen to supply it. This will cause lactic acid production. We see metabolic acidosis resulting from this lactic acid production. This will immediately cause breathing to increase. Respiratory acidosis is going to occur when our breathing mechanism is going to be faulty. So if we cannot breathe off carbon dioxide fast enough, or there is something obstructing carbon dioxide from being able to flow out of the body, it is going to build up. And we cannot compensate for that with breathing changes like we normally could. So this is what is called respiratory acidosis. In the blood, we have a buffer that is going to build to carbon dioxide and it is going to exchange it at the levels of the lungs. So our normal buffering system is called the carbonic acid equation, right? So we will have oxygen binding, and that will create water. Once we have water bound and we have carbon dioxide as a byproduct of metabolism, they will enter the carbonic acid equation through an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase. This is a reversible reaction, right? This is a reversible reaction where we can go to bicarbonate and a hydrogen ion, or we can go back to carbon dioxide and water. So at the level of the lungs, we will convert carbonic acid back to carbon dioxide and water so that we can breathe it off. So when we breathe and we expire, we are breathing not just carbon dioxide out, but also water vapor at the same time. If we have a uh, situation like hyperventilation, Hyperventilation is going to produce alkalosis or a basic state. When we hyperventilate, we are breathing off more than we are taking in. Therefore, our carbon dioxide levels go far, far down, and that leads to a basic state of the blood, and that is an alkalotic state, right? So we have respiratory alkalosis, which is going to result from breathing too much. Secondary functions for the respiratory we see phonation. This is the process of producing sound as the airflow goes over our vocal cords. We also have lymphoid tissues, which are going to secrete cytokines, which are inflammatory lipid mediators. We can also do a small degree of heat and water exchange. So we breathe off water vapor whenever we are breathing out. We also breathe off heat, right? We're going to saturate the air as it comes into the body, right? Air is going to be saturated with 47 millimeters of mercury of humidified water vapor. Also, as it enters the body, it's going to be warm to body temperature as it goes through the trachea. 
So we are going to warm up the air that we're breathing in, unless it is the uh, temperature of the body already, which would be an extremely hot day. And we are also going to humidify the air. The air that we breathe in is going to have to be filtered. There are particulates in the atmosphere that we are going to have to filter out whenever we are breathing in. As we are breathing in, we have impaction of dust, dirt, chemicals, whatever we breathe in, and terminal mucus. And that mucus is going to be sitting on the lining of the airway. The mucus is going to transport that substance back up so we can try and breathe it off or cough it out or whatever. And this is known as the mucociliary escalator. The terminal bronchiole is going to be the final conducting airway. This is the final mucus point as well. So the terminal bronchiole is where we get before we go into the alveoli, before we get to the functional exchange zone. And that is the final point where mucus exists also. We don't have mucus in the functional exchange zone because if that were the case, it would block the diffusion of gases across the, uh, the, the membrane. <clears throat> so the ciliated epithelium that we have within the trachea, within the back of the throat, the pharynx and the bronchioles is going to push that uh, dirt, dust, sedimentation back up towards the pharynx. So we have the mucociliary escalator. All the cardiac output that we have from the heart is going to go through the lungs. Okay. So all of this cardiac output is going to go through the lungs every single time it circulates around. This is also going to be the regulation point for bioactive substances like histamine and angiotensin 1. Histamine being an inflammatory compound, angiotensin 1 being converted to angiotensin 2, which is involved in water retention and electrolyte retention. When we talk about breathing, we have to talk about volumes of air. So if we look at equations, we have several equations that we are going to use to classify the volumes of air that we're breathing in and out. As we look at an equation, our capital V is going to be total gas volume. Our lowercase v t is going to be tidal volume. This is the amount of air that you breathe out and in during a normal quiet breath. Our lowercase v a is alveolar gas volume. This is the gas volume of the alveoli at the individual alveolar level. And then V dot A is going to be the alveolar ventilation, which is going to be how much air is exchanged by the alveoli per minute. And this can also be seen as volume per minute. PVO2 is going to be the partial pressure of oxygen in the mixed venous blood. If that's the case, then PaO2 is the partial pressure in arterial blood. STD, uh, PD is the standard temperature, standard pressure. Okay, so this is what we normally have. Standard temperature is zero degrees Celsius. Standard pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury, and that is at sea level and normally dry air. Our final one is BIPS, B-I-P-S. This stands for body temperature, which is around 37 degrees Celsius. Pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, and a saturation. Okay, so normally our saturated, our alveoli are saturated during ventilation. All right, so airway passage. Expiration and mostly inspiration are usually passive processes, especially at rest. We're going to have movement by convection, right? In the large airways, such as the trachea and the main stem bronchus, we have movement by convection. The movement in the smaller airways, terminal airways, and the alveoli is going to be by diffusion. We then have a segment known as the parenchyma. The parenchyma are the sections of the lungs where the actual alveoli reside. We start off the airways with the trachea, and that is going to lead to 23 dichotomous branching points, which means that we are going to have 23 branches or bifurcations 
from the trachea down to the individual alveoli. When we go from the trachea into the lung, we split off into left and right main stem bronchuses. We have a left and right lung, so we have to split off into two tubes, two main bronchuses going to the left and the right. The left lung is going to be a little bit smaller. It's going to account for the cardiac notch, which is the protrusion of the left ventricle into the left side. The right one is a little bit larger. It's going to have three lobes compared to the two lobes of the left. The right is more linear, so the aspirated contents will favor this side. Posterior membrane of the trachea is smooth muscle, so that means that the trachea does have the ability to expand and contract as the air changes volume. As we enter into the lungs, we first have the tubes of the bronchi. The bronchi are going to categorize the first 10 branching points. So branches one through 10 off of the trachea are known as the bronchi. This is where the direct bronchial circulation from the aorta goes. They have ciliated columnar cells, which are going to participate in passing that mucus back up through the mucociliary escalator. Next, we have 11 through 16 branching points, and these are going to be the bronchioles. These are ciliated cuboidal epithelium, all right? Also going to work with the mucociliary escalator. Finally, we have 17 through 19, okay? 17 through 19 are the respiratory bronchioles. This is where the pulmonary exchange passes into the first point of gas exchange at the alveoli. Bronchial circulation is going to go until we hit the terminal bronchial, and then it's going to change into the pulmonary circulation. When we pass through the lungs, we have no exchange happening for the first 16 bifurcations or branching points from the trachea down to the alveoli. So the first 16 branching points are purely conduction. We have no exchange, meaning that this is called dead space, okay? So no gas exchange happens. This is dead space of air. As we move through the points 17 through 23 are known as the acini or the acina region. This of course is the functional area. This is where diffusion will take place for exchanging the gases between the body and the outside environment. The acinous tissue is squamous epithelium. It's going to be a flat epithelial cell lining, and that's going to allow for easy diffusion across the membrane. Finally, as we get to the 23rd branching point, this is going to be the alveoli. The alveolus is going to be the site where we do exchange the gas back and forth. We have two types of respiratory cells here. All right, they are termed type one and type two respiratory cells. We also have the pulmonary capillary bed. So starting from the trachea, our branching points one through 16 are the conducting zones and we have nothing but dead space there. No gas exchange, so this is what we call anatomical dead space. 17 through 19 are the respiratory bronchioles. These are the technical transition zone. This is where the gas exchange is dependent on the number of alveoli present. So we could have a little bit of gas exchange happening if there are a large amount of alveoli at that particular branch. So innervation of the lungs, see innervation by neurological signaling. The bronchi constrict because of what we term as alpha adrenergic receptors. So alpha adrenergic receptors, when they are stimulated, will cause the bronchi to constrict, which is going to shorten or uh, constrict the airway. They will dilate from the opposite side of receptor, which are called beta adrenergic receptors. When the beta adrenergic receptors are stimulated. This will cause bronchi dilation, which will open the airway and allow for more gas to exchange. When we are breathing atmospheric air in, there is not really going to be any carbon dioxide there. The only place the carbon dioxide comes from is inside of our bodies. So it's a product of our own metabolism. Therefore, it is actually negligible in the environmental atmosphere around us. 
So our two types of alveolar and epithelial cells, we have type one cells that are going to be very thin, squamous epithelium. These are going to cover about 95% of the surface area, All right? They're going to be spread very thin. They're less numerous in the total population than the type two, even though they cover 95% of the surface area. So they're less in, uh, in population, All right, than the type two cells. Our type two alveolar cells, or what are known as pneumocytes, are going to be more numerous than the type one, but they only cover 5% of the surface area. They are extremely important, however, because they do produce surfactant. And surfactant is going to reduce the tension within the lung, which is going to be able to keep us alive because it keeps the lung from collapsing in on itself. So it's going to reduce the tension within the lung and it's going to allow the lung to inflate and deflate adequately so that we can get enough air in while we breathe. We do have some exchange between these cells. Type two cells do have the ability to differentiate into type one cells to replace type one cells if they have died. Those type two cells or type two pneumocytes are producing our surfactant. Surfactant is a detergent in nature, right? When we have surfactant that has been used, the resident macrophages of the lungs will digest it. It will be sent out to the lymphatics for uh, filtration and circulation. In between the alveoli, we have what are known as the pore of cone or the little holes inside of the capillary wall, right? This is going to be where the gas exchange is going to happen. So we see gas exchange between adjacent alveoli through the pore of cone. The alveolar, uh, alveoli and alveolar sac uh, blood gas interface which is the amount of surface area that there is for act actual exchange between the atmosphere and the bloodstream is quite massive. If we were to pull all the alveoli out, place them down and stretch them out across the ground, it will cover a total space of 85 meters square. So what happens with the circulation? Well, with the circulation, we have the red blood cells coming into the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. The red blood cells aren't going to stay there long. They only stay in the lung capillary system for about three fourths of a second. And they have to pick up oxygen during that time. So the bronchial arteries will branch with airways. This is going to create a one-to-one -one blood vessel and airway association. Bronchial veins empty into the pulmonary veins. Pulmonary veins are now going to be oxygenated blood. This is known as a right to left shunt, right? This means that we're taking blood from the right side to the left side. It is going to be deoxygenated and then turned into oxygenated. It is a shunt because it takes um, blood that is not being used for tissue metabolism and moves it from the venous side of the circulation to the arterial side of the circulation. All right, so talking about the pleura, the visceral pleura is going to be the area around the lungs. We have veins in this region. They're going to drain into the pulmonary veins also. This is a second uh, right to left shunt that we see, not just with the bronchioles, but also with the visceral pleura as well. What this means is that we have probably around 5% of our cardiac output that is moved directly from the right to the left side of the circulation through the pulmonary system, which means that we have about 5% of the cardiac output that does not become oxygenated. It's going to move through the body without becoming oxygenated. Pulmonary circulation is about one sixth of our vascular resistance for the systemic circulation, which is pretty disproportionate for the amount that it gets. This is for the purpose of preventing alveolar flutter. So if the pulmonary circulation was much less resistant or it didn't give us as much resistance, the hydrostatic pressure from the blood flowing into the lungs would cause water to filter out of the capillaries and into the alveoli. 
If that were to happen, it would flood the alveoli and the gases would not be able to be exchanged. We would literally drown in our own fluid. So the alveoli must remain dry for gas exchange. All right, so discussing pleural pressure. Talked about the pleural cavity a little bit earlier. The visceral pleura is the membrane surrounding the entire lung, right? We have a parietal pleura, which is lining the wall of the chest. And we have a visceral pleura, which is lining the actual lung itself. We have a hilum, which is where the right and left main stem bronchus enter the lung. The atmospheric pressure is going to be 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. We saw this with our STPD terminology earlier. This is a combination of all the gases that exist in the air. So that means that there's going to be a partial pressure of each one of these gases. Water vapor, H2O dissolved in the atmosphere, is going to constitute 47 millimeters of mercury of pressure itself, right? So since the lung is dry, the pressure is actually going to be a less than the atmospheric pressure. We have no water vapor in the lung, so that means that usual lung pressure is going to be about 713 millimeters of mercury if we subtract that water vapor pressure. When we see mixed uh, resting venous blood, total partial pressure is going to be 716 millimeters of mercury. This is because we have about 50 millimeters of mercury less partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial blood. Partial pressure of arterial blood concentrations decrease as we age because we have more resistance to gas flow and less efficient gas exchange. Partial pressure of oxygen is going to be about 160 millimeters of mercury in the atmospheric ambient air. As we move down into the blood, we go from 150 millimeters of mercury in the trachea down to about 100 at the level of the alveoli down to 90 in the arterial blood and all the way down to 40 in the venous circulation. Partial pressure of CO2 is going to be maintained relatively constant. In the alveolar and arterial blood, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is about 40 millimeters of mercury. After we pass through the circulation, go to the venous side, it only goes up slightly. It goes up to about 46 millimeters of mercury. This is mostly because of the bicarbonate buffering system. So that equation for the carbonic acid we saw earlier with carbon dioxide combining with water to form carbonic acid, that is going to be how we are going to buffer carbon dioxide. So in the blood, it is buffered instead of remains in its gaseous form. So when it is buffered like this, it doesn't exert any pressure. That's why there's so little increase from the arterial side to the venous side. The velocity of air is going to decrease in proportion to the increase in surface area. This is so we can give maximal amount of time for oxygen to diffuse through the alveoli. What we see at the acenus or the level of the alveoli is what we know as Brownian movement. It's also known as thermodynamic movement. This is how oxygen gets into the blood, okay? So we're following Brownian movement, and this follows the fixed law of diffusion. In the fixed law of diffusion, the D represents the solubility, and we're dividing that by the square root of the molecular weight of the gas. The solubility coefficient, which is S, is 0 0.00003 for oxygen. How we transport oxygen in the blood is going to be by hemoglobin. Normally, our hemoglobin is going to be almost saturated, roughly 98%, maybe 99% saturation. That means that 98% of the possible binding sites or possible heme groups that oxygen could bind to on the red blood cells are occupied at any one time during the arterial blood flow. If we used an oxygen mask for, uh, for a set, to breathe pure oxygen, and we were already at 98% saturation. That means that we could only increase our saturation by 2% at the maximum. So regardless of how much oxygen we breathe in, how pure the oxygen in the, in the air is that we are breathing, 
we can only increase the amount of hemoglobin binding by 2%, which is not that much. So oxygen masks are usually very uh, minimally effective or pretty much useless when it comes to being at sea level because we already have that high level of saturation at our 760 millimeters of mercury air pressure. So heme groups are the groups inside of the hemoglobin that are going to be bound. And those heme groups are going to receive oxygen, right? The pressure required for 50% of hemoglobin to be bound to oxygen is only 27 millimeters of mercury. If we recall, in arterial blood, we are going to have a partial pressure of oxygen of about 90, okay? So that means that we could go a long way down and still have 50% of our hemoglobin bound to oxygen. Temperature changes are going to be one way that we change binding affinity for oxygen. Cold air is going to cause hemoglobin to hold on to oxygen tighter so that less of it dissociates into the blood. This is a reason for why our skin becomes more red when we are cold, because oxygen is bound to hemoglobin in the blood, less of it is being dispersed off into the tissues. On our right side here, this is what we call the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve or the oxyhemoglobin saturation curve. We can see that with increases in partial pressure of oxygen, we increase the amount of hemoglobin that is going to be saturated with oxygen until we get up to the top where we have almost 100%. So in the case of an increased pH, increased pH means it is a more basic blood, all right? pH goes up, that's a more basic or alkaline blood. In that case, we're going to have higher levels of saturation for oxygen because we have less need for oxygen to be displaced. In the middle, we can see that we have a pretty normal ox uh, curve here. Um, this is our normal saturation. If we see, for instance, an increase in temperature, or we have an increase in, uh, or a decrease in pH, then we are going to have less oxygen bound to hemoglobin. Increase in temperature, less pH, more acidic pH, we're going to dissociate the oxygen a lot more easily. And that is so that the oxygen can go directly to the tissues. All right, so talking about that oxyhemoglobin dissociation, if we increase carbon dioxide, hydrogen ion, and decrease pH because we are more acidic, this leads to a right shift in the dissociation curve, i.e. less oxygen bound to hemoglobin. We also see what we call the Bohr effect. This is a right to left shift due to the carbon dioxide and hydrogen ion changes. Carbon dioxide is going to be able to bind to hemoglobin and change its conformation. When that happens, it immediately causes oxygen to release. So binding of carbon dioxide inspires oxygen to be released and vice versa. Binding of oxygen inspires carbon dioxide to be released. Exercise, another thing that's going to change it is going to cause a right shift in the curve i.e. more oxygen being dispersed off of the hemoglobin, less oxygen bound to hemoglobin. 2% of our oxygen concentration is actually dissolved in the blood plasma. So 98% of that concentration is going to be bound to hemoglobin at any one time. Carbon dioxide is going to be transported bound to the bicarbonate buffering system for 90% of it. About 5% of it is going to be dissolved in the plasma. This is why we saw the increase of 40 millimeters of mercury to 46 millimeters of mercury from the arterial to venous side, respectively. Carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme which is going to catalyze the carbonic acid equation. So this is going to catalyze the formation of our carbonic acid, which is the intermediate between carbon dioxide and bicarbonate ions. To mirror the Bohr effect, we have something known as the Haldane effect. Haldane effect is where oxygen transport is going to affect carbon dioxide. The Bohr effect was carbon dioxide binding leading to oxygen dissociation. Here we see oxygen binding leading to carbon dioxide dissociation. So oxygen binding is going to cause carbon dioxide to dissociate and we're going to move that curve back to the left. All right, so some of our mechanisms of breathing here. 
We're going to coordinate the mechanism of breathing via the ribs, the thoracic cage, the intercostal muscles, and the diaphragm. How we measure volumes going in and out of the lungs is known as a process called spirometry. Spirometry is going to be able to measure lung volumes and changes. The only thing that we cannot measure is called residual volume. And this is the amount of air that's left in the lungs after maximum expiration. It's the amount of air that stays in the lungs at all times and never leaves. Our lung volume capacity declines by about 1% per year uh, after our 20s. And that is because of a lack of elasticity in the lung itself. So the lung becomes less elastic as we get older. So when we age, we have less ability for that lung to expand. Females usually have a less lung volume than males. This is mostly because of body size and size of the thoracic cage. So we see about 10 to 15% less lung volume on average. For inspiratory musculature, during inspiration or breathing air in, the diaphragm is going to contract. And that gives us about two thirds of the force that we need in order to get blood or uh, to get air into the lungs, right? So the diaphragm is going to exist as a hemisphere or a hemidiaphragm. And this means that there are two of the two sides of it. So pretty much we have one side on the left of the body, one side on the right of the body, and they're controlled contralaterally, uh, contralaterally by what we know as the phrenic nerve. Innervation of the diaphragm comes from the phrenic nerve, and this is from the nerve roots of the C3, C4, and C5 vertebrae. The external intercostal muscles are going to also be uh, active in the case of inspiration. These are controlled by the T1 through 11 vertebrae. The accessory muscles are going to be in the, uh, the neck. We have the scalenes and the sternocleidomastoids, which both are able to lift the clavicle. This is C1 through C5 innervation. During expiratory breathing, we have a passive process. So during normal relaxed breathing, expiration is entirely passive. There is no contraction going on there. The active process is when we have forced expiration or expiration during uh, more intense activity or body movement. This is going to include the internal intercostals, the rectus abdominis and transverse abdominis as well. When we talk about the pleura, we just talked, we talked about the pleural space a little bit. The visceral pleura is going to be the lining of connective tissue membrane that is going to be directly on top of the lung. The parietal pleura is going to be what is lining the chest wall. In between the parietal and visceral pleura, we have what is known as parietal fluid. And this is in the pleural cavity. And the pleural cavity contains about 10 milliliters of pleural fluid. The pleura is going to couple the lungs to the chest wall. And this allows for synchronicity, meaning that the expansion of the chest wall is going to couple with the expansion of the lungs. If we don't have that attachment, the lungs would shrivel up. And this is what we know as a pneumothorax or a collapsed lung. The lungs don't have the ability to contract on their own. So that means that they rely on that pleural movement, that attachment to the actual chest wall. Um, they rely on that to be able to expand. So between that space of the visceral and pleural pleura, this is going to have a negative pressure. This is where we see the negative pressure relative to the atmosphere. And that is how we can expand the lung. The respiratory uh, pressure in the potential space is very, very small. So we actually use uh, centimeters of mercury here instead of millimeters of mercury to measure the pressure. As I mentioned a little bit earlier with the pneumothorax, pneumothorax is the condition where that chest wall and the lung are separated and the pleural coupling is no longer uh, intact. Uh, this can happen because of several different things, but our most common is going to be a stab wound in the chest. So. This happens when the intrapleural pressure becomes the same as atmospheric. We no longer have that negative pressure gradient across the pleural space. We dissociate the coupling, and therefore, um, we now have an equal space on the inside and outside. 
It's only going to affect one side of the lungs because of the mediastinum chamber in the middle. So if we have a pneumothorax on one side of the body, the opposite lung will still work, but that lung that did have the, uh, the stab in it is going to be functionally uh, pretty inert or unable to function. At FRC, which is functional residual capacity, the chest wall is about at total 45% uh, of the lung capacity that it can reach. But if we separate that lung from the chest wall and a pneumothorax, then the lung will collapse and the chest wall will actually expand a little bit to about 75% of total lung capacity. Some pathological changes that we can see in the lung, uh, fibrosis or emphysema. Uh, in the case of pulmonary fibrosis, this will lead to increased lung recoil, meaning that the lung will uh, shrivel up and contract on itself more, uh, more easily. For emphysema, this will cause decreased lung, re or lung recoil, meaning that it's more difficult to breathe out. It's very difficult to uh, get air out of the lung. The measurement of compliance is the distensibility of the lung or chest wall. You see a couple of different pressures that we can measure here. One is the transpulmonary pressure. Transpulmonary pressure is the difference between the alveolar and intrapleural pressures. So the pressure in the pleural cavity and the pressure of the alveoli are going to be different numbers. And that is called transpulmonary pressure. At end of expiration, we see a plus five centimeters of, merc of, uh, of water, centimeters of water. And at uh, during inspiration, we see a plus seven centimeter of water pressure. Alveolar pressure decreases during inspiration. The transpulmonary pressure, pressure across the lung is always going to be positive. During inspiration, we see that the intrapleural pressure decreases uh, to a greater degree so that the transpulmonary pressure becomes more positive with a larger gradient. Compliance is going to be relative to lung volume change, right? So if there's a large volume change, even with a small pressure change above functional residual capacity, this means that the most compliant breathing is going to happen around functional residual capacity or the easiest expansion or retraction. All right, lung recoil, our next concept. We see recoil here. Lung recoil is going to be because of the elastic nature. Right? We have elastic and collagen fibrils and proteins that are going to allow for the lung to recoil or bring back limb on itself pretty easily. We have a thin layer of water on the alveolar epithelium, and that is going to create surface tension. It's going to exist on the alveolus, and that actually causes the alveolus to collapse whenever it's breathed out. So the alveolus would collapse if the surface forces were not present there. We have a concept that we know as hysteresis. Hysteresis is caused by inertia, which is a property of matter. Bill Nye the science guy joke. Surface forces, non-perfect elasticity, and it's the process of the lagging lung volume, right? This means that during inspiration, it takes a longer time for the lung to expand than it should with our air change, right? It's very prominent during inspiration. It takes a little bit longer for the lung to expand out than it does for the lung to contract and pull back in. This hysteresis is going to be why we see a sigmoidal curve for the lung inflation. So that means for volume change, the curve is going to be a sigmoid, not a linear change. This is where we get the pressure volume loop concept from because collapsed alveoli are more difficult to inflate. This is where we have the process of the surfactant come in and be very important. Type two pneumocytes will secrete that surfactant and that is going to decrease the tension there. Another detergent that we come across here along with surfactant is DPPC, which is dipmetylphosphatidylcholine. Don't ask me to say that twice. And that is also going to be made as part of the surfactant in the type two cells. Surfactant is a detergent 
um, and it's going to create that decrease that surface tension by pretty much moving itself in between the water molecules that exist on the alveolar surface. So that means that the hydrogen bonding is much less likely and much more difficult between the oxygen or the, between the, uh, the water molecules. So that the surface tension that they create is less interdissipated. This keeps that surface uh, tension proportional to the alveolar size. All right, let's see, law of Laplace, uh, law of Laplace is going to be a pressure changes and radius changes for the alveoli. Uh, this explains why the small alveolus has a higher pressure than a larger alveolus, because pressure is going to be equal to two times the actual tension divided by the radius of the sphere. It's going to be more of a physics concept. When we look at the lung itself, the actual lung, the apical portion is the top of the lung. The base is going to be the bottom of the lung. The apical portion or the top of the lung has the largest alveoli. And as we move towards the base or move towards the bottom, the alveoli gets smaller and smaller. Surfactant is going to decrease the work of breathing because we lessen the muscular force that's needed to inflate the alveoli. The DPPC that we see in the type 2 pneumocytes is going to be present as well. And this is going to be used with premature babies or preemie babies in place of surfactant because at that time, the pre, uh, type 2 pneumocytes are not mature enough yet for the baby to actually produce surfactant. All right, some pathologies of the respiratory system. <clears throat> Number one, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, is emphysema. Emphysema causes an increased residual volume because the lung lacks recoil. So the lung doesn't recoil well, we can't breathe air out well. So we have an increased residual volume. There's more air left in the lung after we breathe out and we increase the volume change resulting in the pressure. Next is fibrosis. Fibrosis is going to be basically the opposite symptomology of emphysema. This is where we have an inability of the lung to expand. So we're going to decrease the residual volume because it's more difficult for us to get air into the lung and actually inflate the lung. So we're going to decrease the residual volume and decrease the volume change. Fibrosis is difficult to get air into the lung, as I just stated. And in emphysema, is it difficult to get air out of the lung? The lung's resistance, as we saw earlier, is one sixth of total resistance. So that's very high relative to its proportional size. The resistance that we see in the actual lung to airflow is going to be measured by a resistance equation. Right? Resistance is going to be equal to the difference in pressure, which is usually the transpulmonary pressure, divided by the flow rate or the flow of air. So at low volumes, the lungs are going to exhibit a high resistance because the chest wall is tethered to it. Talking about lung capacities, vital capacity is the total amount of air that we can possibly breathe. Vital capacity is going to be, you breathe in as much as you can and then you breathe out as much as you can all at once. And that is the forced vital capacity, all right? Vital capacity is going to be the total lung capacity, which is everything. Divide, uh, I'm sorry, subtracted from the residual volume, which is that amount of air that's left over that you simply cannot reach. The forced vital capacity is going to be 85% of expiration. And this is how much can be accomplished in one second of the forced vital capacity. So how much can we expire in one second of air? All right, uh, emphysema, as we stated, easy inspiration, uh, but we have lack of recoil. So therefore it's difficult to exhale. For our normal breathing or our tidal volume where it's just regular relaxed euthmic breathing, we have to be able to breathe a greater volume than the dead space volume that we have inside of the bronchioles. Because if we don't, then we won't get air enough in to actually reach the alveoli. So we have to be able to ventilate the alveoli with our breath. When we talk about dead space, we talked about anatomical dead space a little bit earlier, and that's that pace of conduction for the bronchioles where the air does not exchange. Physiological dead space is the total dead space. So physiological dead space is the anatomical dead space of the bronchioles and the alveolar dead space, right? 
physiological dead space usually um, should be equal to the alveolar dead space in a normal lung. When we see differences in that, or we change the dead space values, usually is when we have a difference in ventilation or perfusion. Perfusion is going to be how much of the lung is going to be exposed to blood. So if all the capillary networks are working, then that means that the blood is perfusing the lung correctly, then we won't have an issue there. Ventilation is how many alveoli are functional, or how much alveolar space is inflated every time we get air in, all right? So when you have perfusion, blood flow, without ventilation, without the alveoli getting the air, this is going to cause a right to left shunt, all right? So we have blood passing through without becoming oxygenated. So this is simply right to left shunt passing arterial blood into the venous circulation without getting any oxygen there. So carbon dioxide will remain elevated. During hyperventilation, this is caused because of just increased ventilation without any metabolic consequences. So increased ventilation without a need to do so. This can lead to hypopnea which hypopnea is going to be a severe lack of carbon dioxide and too much oxygen. Hyperpnea is the opposite of that. This is where we have increased ventilation proportional to metabolic break. This happens when we do things like exercise. And this happens because we need to exchange that carbon dioxide that we produced because of increasing metabolism of the tissues. So hyperpnea or increased ventilation with a equal increase in carbon dioxide levels is going to be normal in the case of exercise. All right, ventilation, hypoventilation, this is going to be under ventilation. So we're decreasing the amount of oxygen that we're breathing in. So we're having increased alveolar carbon dioxide. Hypopnea, decreased ventilation proportional to metabolic rate. This can happen in a very cold environment where our metabolic rate slows down to preserve energy and keep blood into the middle of our bodies to perfuse our organs. Hypercapnia and hypoxia are both going to be influential on the bronchioles. These are both going to dilate the bronchioles to try and get more air in. And hypocapnia is going to be the opposite. This is going to constrict the bronchioles because this could be in a case of hyperventilation. All right, let's see. Some abnormalities that we see, we already talked about hypoxia a little bit. Hypoxia in peripheral arterioles can lead to redirecting the blood flow to better ventilated areas. Hypocapnia, this constricts the peripheral bronchioles in the lung, leading to direct airflow to better areas of perfusion. Global hypoxia is going to lead to pulmonary hypertension and potential edema. Alveolar vessels, we don't really have that large of a red blood cell population. So the extra alveolar vessels at the junctions with alveoli are more highly perfused uh, because of the open tethering of the alveolar tissues. All right, we talk about the zones of the lung. We have three zones. Zone one doesn't usually exist in normal people. And zone one would be where the alveolar pressure is actually greater than the pressure in the arteries and the veins. Zone two is going to be pretty small. It's going to exist towards the top of the lung, right? It's going to have a hydrostatic effect. And this is going to be where the arterial pressure is greater than the alveolar pressure, but the alveolar pressure is less, is, is greater than the venous pressure, right? This is going to be a hydrostatic effect. This means that we have some blood flow, but it's not continuous. Zone three is continuous blood flow. This is what we have through most of the lung tissue. And this is where the alveolar pressure is less than both that found in the arteries and the veins. From the top to the bottom of zone two, we have a drastic increase in overall blood flow as we go from the top of the lung to the bottom of the zone. All right, a PV mismatch, which is perfusion ventilation mismatch. We talked about perfusion and ventilation a little bit earlier. This is simply where they don't match up. So this is where we either have more perfusion in an area than we have ventilation, or we have more ventilation than perfusion. At the apex of the lung or the top of the lung, 
we have less blood flow than we have ventilation. So we have more air coming in than we have blood to match it. As we move down the lung, that is going to change. So move down the lung, we actually become more perfused and then the ventilation becomes less as we get to the bottom. The ventilation perfusion only will match up at the center of the lung. And if the ratio is greater than one, there's more ventilation than perfusion if we talk about the VAQ relationship. All right, our control of ventilation in the central nervous system, this comes from the medulla oblongata in the pons. This is known as the PRG, which is the pontine respiratory group, DRG, which is the dorsal respiratory group, and the VRG, which is the ventral respiratory group. The PRG or the pontine respiratory group is going to be bilateral in the upper pons. This is both inspiratory and expiratory functionality. The apneustic center is going to be where we provide a prolonged inspiration or gasps during apneuses. The DRG or dorsal respiratory group is going to innervate the motor neurons of the phrenic nerve, which is going to drive the diaphragm. The ventral respiratory group is connected to the DRG is going to send uh, signals to the accessory muscles. So this is going to innervate the scalene, sternocleidomastoid, mastoid, et cetera. The VRG is going to allow for cyclic breathing. So the VRG is what is going to be important in blocking expiration while inspiration occurs. So if it wasn't for the VRG, we would constantly be switching back and forth between expiration and inspiration. It would kind of be like this weird he 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 type thing. So the VRG is going to block our ability to breathe out while we are breathing in. All right, so integration site. Sensory input for the thorax and the abdomen goes straight to the DRG. Without the PRG or the pontine respiratory group, our respiration would not be as quick. We wouldn't be able to switch between expiration and inspiration as easily. So our respiration would actually be slower and we would have a larger tidal volume. All right. One thing that's interesting here to discuss is Ondine's Curse. Ondine's Curse is based on the legend of Ondine, which, who was a water nymph or siren. And this causes, uh, this curse causes someone to become insensitive to carbon dioxide. And if you become insensitive to carbon dioxide, then your body doesn't sense that you have any carbon dioxide which means your body's respiratory centers don't have a drive for you to breathe it out, which actually means that your body uh, breathing actually becomes involuntarily stopped and the breathing will slow down and stop because we don't sense any sort of carbon dioxide. Those with Ondine's curse have to actively think about breathing. They have to become consciously aware of their breathing and force it to happen and they have to sleep with some sort of ventilation system because if they don't, then they will not be able to cause themselves to start breathing while they are asleep and they could die uh, during the night from not breathing. All right. So our last concept is the chemoreceptors. We talked about the chemoreceptors a little bit earlier, sensing changes of gases and things in the bloodstream. They're going to exist in two places. We have the carotid bodies, which is in the carotid arteries. These are going to be innervated by the DRG or dorsal respiratory group and the glossopharyngeal nerve. The aortic bodies are going to be non-functional for respiratory purposes. Right? So the carotid bodies are pretty much what we sense the peripheral chemoreceptor functionality with. They are going to be very rapid and they respond to oxygen, carbon dioxide, and pH changes. If our oxygen decreases by 60 to 80 millimeters of mercury, it will stimulate a significant response because of the carotid body chemoreceptor. The chemo, uh, carotid body uh, chemoreceptors actually have the highest metabolic rate uh, per gram of tissue of any tissue in the body, and they're very highly perfused. We have two types of carotid body cells. These are known as the glomus cells. They can be inhibited by potassium channels and depolarization of calcium entry. If we fall below 80 millimeters of mercury for the oxygen in the arterial circulation, 
we then have an intense response. And the carotid bodies are only going to be O2 sensors to detect changes in pressure in the blood. We respond to metabolic acidosis or alkalosis in this position. The central chemosensitive regions are going to be in the central nervous system. And this is going to be in the bilateral ventrolateral medulla. Since it is in the blood-brain barrier, that means there is no hydrogen ion filtration or no acid. So therefore, we do not sense hydrogen ions here. The only thing that we sense is going to be carbon dioxide. We have to be able to sense carbon dioxide here. So a carbon dioxide change is going to stimulate these regions. We have no response to partial pressure oxygen changes unless it is low enough to induce acidosis. All right, let's see. Nickel interference, carotid stimulation, that's about it. All right, everyone. That was respiration and all the information that you need to know about respiration centers. Thank you all for joining me for this lecture. Like and subscribe to the channel, Twisted Science. Also, patreon.com slash twisted science for more information. Thank you all for joining me and I will see you next time.